data. So welcome everyone to our last session of the volunteer training series for this winter. We might be adding some more over the summer based on needs that we're hearing about. Um, I'm Susan Sanford. I work for the Land and Water Resources Department, which is the department that houses Dane County Parks. And I work on strategic engagement, working with friends groups, working on our equity and inclusion initiatives and doing some marketing and outreach. So if I haven't met you yet, that's me. Um, I'm also going to let Claire Lamberg, if you want to unmute and just introduce yourself in case people haven't met you yet. Yeah, sure. I'm Claire Lamberg. I'm the volunteer coordinator um, here at Dean County Parks and Land and Water. Um, so for some of you, maybe even conversations regarding signage in your parks that you want to do as a volunteer friends group and for others, I'm interested in your ideas. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to me with any volunteer related questions you have. Great, thanks, Claire. So just some quick virtual meeting tips, you know, two years into COVID, I think most people are up to speed, but try and stay muted. Uh, if you have a question, throw it in the chat. We'll get to the questions at the end, or if Chris sees it along the way, he might stop and answer it. Uh, and we're recording the training. So if someone, I know this is during the day, if someone from your group wanted to join and they couldn't, they should, they'll be able to watch the training later. I uh, wanna thank our sponsor, the Foundation for Dane County Parks. The foundation raises funds to support our park system, promoting volunteerism, education, interpretation, and community involvement. And we do have a representative. Elisa, do you wanna say anything about the foundation? Sure. I mean, that's a great summary of what we do. My name's Elisa. I work for the foundation. Um, and I'll just say, I'm really glad that this interpretive signage uh, workshop is one of the sessions for, for this whole series, because one of the things that the foundation does um, is provide grants to friends groups for the projects that they do out in the parks. And a lot of them include interpretive signage. So I think it's really nice to have some guidelines and and some you know tips and tricks for for people who are interested in doing that. So we're the foundation is super happy to to support these workshops. I think they've been really great so far. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, and they they sponsored the entire volunteer training series this winter. So a big thank you to them for helping kind of build our build our capacity. There's some of them represented in this picture. Um, just note there's a volunteer appreciation picnic on May 10th. Uh, more details coming about that, so save the date. And then I know we have a, a wide range of representatives on the call today. It's not just Dane County Parks Friends Group. This session is definitely applicable to a lot of different groups that might be working on signage. If you are a friends group, I just want to remind you that we have this kind of new uh, friends group resource page and we do have one of the buttons on there is park signage guidelines. Uh, we put this together about a year ago to kind of give an overview of some tips if you're developing a sign. Um, it also has kind of different layout content fabric fabrication tips. It has some design tips, which Chris is going to go into way more detail on that, but these are just some basic kind of principles to be thinking about when you design it. And it also has the Dane County Parks logo, um, so you could download that easily. And if you're putting a sign in a park, it has to be go through Dane County Parks prior to placement. So before starting your project, uh, the contact used to be Sarah Regelman and she moved on to the DNR. So we're still figuring out who the, the permanent contact is gonna be, but for now it would be Lael Pasquale. You can reach out to her and um, kind of pitch your idea that you're, before you, you know, go down the whole road of, of doing it. So just a reminder. And then I want to thank our presenter, Chris Evans. Uh, he's the founder and principal of Drum and Hands Design in Minnesota. And he has an exciting presentation lined up for you. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and kick it over to him. Thanks for that intro. I'll start sharing mine here. Um, oops, I should go back to the screen. So, um, well, I guess start with me. So my name is Chris Evans. I had the name first. I am not an Avenger. Um, you can contact me here. Um, you know, you got a few questions. You're just trying to get started. You got a, You got a one particular panel that's giving you trouble. Like, you know, shoot me an email. We can get on the phone, just chat about them things. I'm, I'm really open to just being playful with other designers out there. 
Um, so I, I have over 17 years of experience in the interpretive field. I do both indoor and outdoor um, exhibits. Um, uh, started in graphic design, moved into exhibit design, and then I also have a foundation in interactive media. So I'll do, um, I don't do exhibit lighting, but if it, it, otherwise, if there's an electron being pushed, I can make it happen. I can code, I can make all the lights light up, I can play your video, edit your video, all that kind of stuff. Um, but today what we're doing is focusing on um, uh, what, I, what I lovingly refer to as the Waysides 101 presentation. So I do a lot of um, National Park Service projects. And when we start a project, we give this presentation. We try to get everybody on the same footing, what's a good starting place. And that, um, so this presentation is a real good um, talking about process and both writing and design concepts um, and how the National Park Service, specifically out of Harpers Ferry Center, um, does their process. So we can learn a lot from that process and then just port it to um, Dane County. So they, you know, I'm really glad on your website, you have design standards, you have your colors, your fonts, all of that is the type of things that designers want to stand on and, and have that available. Um, before I dive in too deep, I also want to bring up um, two books. I just really quickly grabbed this on, on Amazon. You can also go direct to the publisher. Um, so the National Association for Interpretation, uh, specifically Paul Caputo, wrote this book um, a few years back, but Interpretation by Design. It's, um, if, you're, if you're a park and somebody has a little bit of design skills but, want, but hasn't gone to design school, this is great. It gets you started. It's, you know, designing for non-designers, thinking about it through an interpretive framework. Really good um, uh, starter manual. The other thing I'll throw out there is the Wayfinding Handbook. Um, I got a copy of that one here in front of me. I refer to it all the time. We're not going to talk a lot about Wayfinding today, but often Wayfinding and interpretive projects kind of get um, built together at the same time with the same pot of money. So um, uh, Wayfinding, you know, my line is that if somebody, um, if they don't know where they're going or they have to find the bathroom first, like they got to get all that done before they're willing to be in a framework to, to learn something. So we want to make sure they'll get all that wayfinding done first. But anyway, back to the presentation. So start out with just some inspiration images. This is it's a History Channel ad. The um, Waysides or outdoor interpretation is sometimes called the, the, the Rodney Danger field of graphic design. It gets no respect. Other things are more fun, more interesting. A, an outdoor graphic panel that you're going to you design and be out for 10 to 20 years has its own complicated um, design needs. And um, this is a great example of we're, what we're trying to do is connect people with the, uh, the same place but maybe with a different time or, or explain the context of what's happening. So this with very little words, very quickly teleported people to another time frame at the same place, same resource. Here's another one, the Berlin Wall, just a few years apart. Or the Hindenburg, wouldn't you wanna walk your dog there? Um, so we're gonna go through, we're gonna start out with uh, five principles for uh, making wayside exhibits. Um, and then uh, then I'm going to show a few examples of, of that being executed. So let's start with the first five. First one here, oops, there we go. A little delay on my side. Wayside exhibits are not a destination. I know that my work is not the reason people are out there you're going to see the resource, resource first. Maybe it's the view of the Grand Canyon. Maybe it's a historic house. Whatever it is, that comes first. I have no illusion. But what I want to do is give a um, aha moment when you're there. You go, oh, I didn't know that. And now I got some more questions. That's where we want to go. Um, and then the other thing is that every time you put a, um, a, an interpretive sign outdoors, you're marring the landscape. So make sure you do it for worthy causes, worthy moments for that interpretation. Otherwise, get it out of there. Move it, you know, 20 feet to the left. Like, you know, you want to be really careful and strategic on where you put things. So here's the first example. You got the trail going down up on the left. That mountain peak is why people are there. They, they're not here to see the sign. 
So in this case, they took the sign, they even turned it sideways, facing another direction, talking about something nearby. They wanted to make sure they didn't get in that photography moment. Um, and then they also uh, didn't want to um, distract people. Number two, you got 30 to maybe 45 seconds if you're lucky. So the National Park Service has done a bunch of testing. Um, when people are out on site, how long do they spend at these moments? Um, I also like to use the 333 rule. So three seconds is the, oh, is this interesting enough that I'm gonna dive in deeper? So that's often a big graphic, a title, something that's gonna catch my attention and be like, oh, I'm gonna dive a little deeper. Three seconds to do that. 30 seconds, which is here, is kind of the meat of it. Can I get that gist of the story across in that 30 second moment? And then some people are gonna to wanna to stay there for three minutes. So I can leave pieces like, you know, a detailed map that somebody can dive into, um, those types of things. Not everybody's gonna get there. The majority of the people are not gonna be at the three minutes. So let's see in 30 seconds, can you get your idea across? Uh, it's not a billboard. We, have, uh, <laughs> we lovingly have the phrase, um, books on sticks. These are not books on sticks. These are really focused and trying to do something very specific. I can flip to the next page here. So here's an example. Taking off that main, the main body of text. This is the first three seconds. Is this intriguing? What's happening here? And do you have a sense in those first three seconds in this one of, of what the interpretive message is? It's like, oh boy, I don't want to walk down this corridor. I might get shot. There's all these different places. There's nowhere safe for me to go. Um, I'm getting, anybody else seeing kind of, there we go. Um, so here is that same panel in context. So we're looking at a very specific view. We're showing a historic picture of that same view and then putting in those laser sights um, on, the, on the rifles. Really quickly conveys your message. Graphically first, a nice punchy headline, not a, not a subject headline, an interpretive headline. So that's number two. If you have questions as we're going, please throw it into the chat. So number three, signs of success. I love when I go out on site um, and I see somebody, their head is going up and down and up and down. They're reading something, they're looking at the landscape. The view that we have people looking is important. It's part of the panel of what we're doing. The other thing is like, hey, buddy, come over here, look at this. And then you see their finger pointing and um, from the panel to the landscape. That is a huge sign of success. You're getting people to interact with exactly what you want them to look at. So here's an example, historic mill. Um, I don't often like to have the same photo of what's in front of you, but in this example, with all those little bubbles and the addition of this um, illustration on top, it's quite effective. So it shows the, um, the water flow, how the turbine works, what's happening on the inside. You're, you're getting that kind of inside view from the outside. This is really effective on getting people to look up, look down. Where's this, where's this coming from? What part existed in the past? What part exists now? Um, and also giving you a view um, from farther away than you are right now. Where's that water coming from? Giving people different perspective is important. Here's another example talking about the architecture of this bridge. So we're doing a cutaway. What's happening on the inside? How is it being put together? How's, what's the engineering? Why does this thing exist? All of that, there's another good example. I think there's another one here. Oh yeah, um, what I like about this one is, so it's how, how tall is the sequoia? It's just ginormous and how do you get a sense of that? Well, on the side here, they put lines every, I think 10 feet and you can literally walk the height of a sequoia um, and they really drive home that sense of scale. This does a really good job at that. The thing that this doesn't do a good job at is accessibility. This rock prevents somebody in a wheelchair from rolling up underneath it. So I would consider a different frame and base. But the idea of, you know, anybody can walk or roll this distance is quite effective. Okay, number four. So what? Often I'm out at sites and we're getting a tour of what the stories are, what the place is. I'll ask, so what? I'm not trying to be impertinent about it. 
but I'm, the my favorite moment is when you know, I can say, okay, I'm a 13 year old kid on a phone standing here with this story. Why should I care? So what? And that on-site interpreter just bounces on it and says, exactly, this is why you should care. That's the golden stuff. That's the stuff that you should put on the panel. Make it really worthwhile. Connect with people. Why make it worth that interruption? Make it worth that mar on the landscape. Let's do something good with that moment. And so I encourage people to continuously ask, so what? I'll do it beginning of the process, end of the process. Um, what is that so what moment? So here in the chat, who can throw this out? Anybody know what this place is? Why this place is important? Anybody recognize anything in there? Kind of looks just like a road in any state, kind of run down. Well, if we can wrap it with some so what, a pretty important moment in our nation's history happened in this exact spot. Let's put it in some context. Let's give that so what. Um, let's bring in that, that, that real meat to that story. Here's another so what. Anybody in the chat know where this is? One more second for people to type. It's out in Hawaii. Pearl Harbor. So and here's a good example of you're showing where the person is standing and what they're looking at, but you're giving them a completely different perspective, the bird's eye view or the drone view, and you're wrapping it in that context. You're really driving home that so what. Here's another example. This is a Japanese American internment camp. And this particular title is um, it's evocative, but it's also a quote from um, one of the internees who was there. And that same fence exists here. And so, and um, yeah. from a design perspective, also the material, you can see that we're using core 10 or weathering steel, which is matching what's happening in the, in the fence. There's an interesting connection there. Um, here's an aside, I, I like core 10 when it's on dirt or grass it self heals somebody cars their name into it eventually the rain will rust it out and it'll disappear on its own but don't put it on concrete because then the it'll just weep under your concrete um okay number five hopefully i'm not moving too fast here for you all single-minded keep it focused so later i'll start i'll show some of the process and one of the the most important thing in my mind in an early stage is a purpose statement. What is our purpose statement? What do we want people to get across from this? When you're writing that purpose statement, avoid too many conjunctions. Because you could say it wants to do this. Oh, and this and this and this. Well, now you just got six panels. You can't fit all that into one. Keep it really clear, and it'll be much more effective. The um, so I'm not a content expert. I'm rarely the content expert on site. I depend on historians and geologists and ecologists and archaeologists, and I depend on their research. But one of the hardest things to do is to filter down the information, not dumb it down, but just give the right amount of information. Um, instead of here's everything, here's exactly what we want you to know. And so that filter, that being single minded really helps. Here's an example of not being single minded. If you were to come across this, how many of you are going to read this? Maybe a title, maybe a picture, and then just move on. Like, this is not engaging for me to dive in. There's no, although they do have one large photo here, then I don't really know where to go. There's just too many different avenues for, for exploration here. This probably should have been four separate panels. So the summary of the top five, waysides are not a destination. So we gotta give them that aha moment. You're lucky to get 30 seconds with them. Make it a good 30 seconds. The success find is the heads moving and the pointing. I love seeing that on site. Saying so what often, 
throughout your whole process. So what? Just keep pushing it to get your stories more clear, more precise, exactly what you want to come across. And then that five, that fifth point, single-minded. We want a really focused story. Um, the graphics are going to take up a lot of space on this on the panel, so you, you have very finite number of words. Um, I work with a lot of writers who are really good at what they do, and very often it'd be like, okay, I, you got 75% of that space. Can you just write it shorter? And it's hard to write shorter. It's very hard to do. Okay, so that was the five big steps. Those are your yardsticks to, to what do you want to accomplish as you're assessing everything as you go. The next is the process. Let's talk about how we make these things. Uh, now, this is from the National Park Service process, so it might be slightly different for an individual project that we work on. I customize it all the time, whatever works for your site and your story. So the National Park Service has a, um, uh, a wayside guide. I encourage you all to download it. It's on the, um, the the Harpers Ferry website, and this is just a page from it. Now, there's a lot of data that's on here, but let's just look at the green boxes for to start up. So the project startup, um, you have existing material, interpretive plans, archaeological plans, resources, pictures, um, buildings, like what is all the stuff you got st that we're standing on to start with? Um, and then choosing your team. Um, Oh, here, I will let's see if I can copy this link. And I just saw somebody ask for that in the chat. Um, I'll make sure that we get that into the chat. Um, actually, if somebody, uh, maybe Claire, you can Google real quick, Harper's Ferry Center Wayside Guide and throw that in the chat. Um, so project startup. It's your team members. Sometimes you don't have a consultant on board. Maybe you're not gonna hire a consultant. Maybe you are. Like start assembling the team. Who needs to be there? What are the pieces that you're missing? Do you need to hire out a designer? Do you need to hire out a writer? Maybe both. Often these projects that I do, it, it's it's paired, a designer and a writer. Two people is enough to, to get the, the projects done. If it's a really big project and there's a lot happening, the, I'm you know, I might have um, a junior designer work with me and a junior writer work um, work with the writer, but um, but in general, those two roles are, are kind of all that you need from at least the consultant point of view. You also need the um, the content expert, which often is somebody on park staff, you know, who's your historian. Um, the next step, site analysis. I've done projects where I don't visit the site. Every project I do where I visit the site is better. All the creative folks, the writers, the designers, if we can smell the air, if we can walk the site, if I need to make a map and I need to know how far away something is, but I've walked it, everything is better in that in that design because I know exactly how far away things. I know when I'm facing north, what am I looking at? I know which way is north. Trying to find that without being on site is tough. Also throughout that my site analysis part is one of my favorite parts of the process. I get to show up at a park, work with you all who are super passionate about your place, your stories, and just that that emotion is um, transferred to the whole team it is a really fun moment. So that site analysis, getting on the ground, getting your stories started, figuring out the places, because all of this is place based. We're putting something outside somewhere. That place matters. Let's go stand there. Uh, then the proposal phase. As a consultant, I, the word proposal confuses me. Like I think of um, an RFP, I'm going to submit a proposal to win a job. In this sense, the Harpers Ferry Center is using proposal like a design brief or a concept plan. Um, let's, you know, let's write that purpose statement. Let's let's talk about the resources, the pictures, what are our stories? Let's let's do napkin sketches of stuff. That is the proposal. It's proto design. If I'm making a thumbnail uh, sketch, I should be willing to crumple it up and throw it out because we have very little effort into it. It's starting. We're getting I need to crumple it up multiple times, right? That that iteration is really important in this proposal phase. Once we kind of agree the proposal phase, this then becomes a yardstick for the rest of the project. We need to live up to the goals that are set in this document. Um, so here the exhibit plan is the first time um, full layout, full writing. Um, we got a first draft of everything, and there might be multiple phases. And here, there's there's um, two. I've done three or four, depending on how big the project is. 
Um, but eventually you have the wayside plan of, okay, here's the designs, here's what we want to print. And I didn't grab the next part of this process, but it's basically like prep your files to send to the printer, get them printed, get them installed. Um, and I can talk if people have questions later about, um, so I don't fabricate, but I work with a lot of printers and a lot of um, uh, metal workers who do all the pieces and stuff. So I can, I can help answer those questions if you have them. Um, okay, so this is a proposal worksheet. This is a um, project that I did in um, just outside of Washington, DC, Arlington House. It overlooks um, the National Mall from uh, just across the river. Um, there's a lot of you know basic data in here. Where is this thing? How does it located? What size is the panel? What's it made of? So eventually I can you know send a, a price list out to a fabricator and say, how much is this gonna cost? But the two most important things that for me that are on here, number one, the purpose statement. What are we trying to accomplish? I'm going to read this one specifically. Uh, to describe site conservation, including how oral histories and archaeology have informed restoration work on site. Concise. There's not a lot of conjunctions. It's a really clear message of exactly what we want to do. Then there's some supporting pieces, supporting notes um, of you know what 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 can help get us there. Um, there's a photo of, so I, I take out soccer cones and that's a north arrow for me to just say, okay, where is this thing? What view am I going to have as a visitor? This also helps the person installing it um, during installation day. There's no roughly where to um, dig the holes. Um, and then the second most important besides the purpose statement is the thumbnail. Um, sometimes if I have an existing picture, I'll put it in the side with an arrow pointing. Um, you know, there's no real words written here yet, but it's visuals first. It's what are we trying to get across? So in this case, we're, we have a photo of archaeology in process that happened at this site, and it's the same view in front of you. And that archaeology is informing all this is the rest of the purpose statement. And so um, this is a, a tactile of some of the um, objects that were found in the in the archaeological um, report. So proposal phase. Concept plan phase. There's that thumbnail that we can, you know, if it's not working, crumple it up, do another one. Just keep iterating those ideas. Uh, let's see. I don't know why the click isn't working. Okay, here's an example of one particular panel moving across different phases. So this is a thumbnail that would have been put in the previous worksheet, but it's just the thumbnail, right? You can see the artist's intention, where the leader lines talking about the different items that are in here. Let's get that approved in the proposal phase. Next, we go to draft plan one. First layout. All the pieces from the thumbnail are in here, but it's probably a little dense. This isn't uh, this isn't hitting number five, you know, a focused message. So you can see version two. It got a little tighter. We put a little bit more breathing room in here. There's good. Um, hierarchy of text start with the big text then we move down to these next which have a black bar behind them um, the caption text is smaller than the main body text none of these uh, column widths are super wide when it gets really wide it gets hard to read in fact i'd argue that this quote is probably too wide there's too much too much in there center text is also harder to read it's best to do left justified rag right um, but then this piece got installed on site. And as you can see the final installation, and there's also, in this case, there's a little audio component that you can listen to, um, that uh, oral history that's connected to this. Um, so now let's just look at some final products and analyze some pieces. So this is one that I did for the Wright Brothers National Memorial, that very famous moment of flight, first in flight. Um, and when you're on site, you can see there's a replica of the rail, and there's also uh, these big granite markers that show four different attempts at flight. And you can you can start at the beginning, and you can walk all four, um, and you can get that sense of the first three were like, yeah, this is kind of working, but I haven't proved it. And then number four was like, oh yeah, clearly we got this. Flight is achieved. Um, this is an example of very little text. There's other panels that probably, you know, maybe you could justify a little bit more, but here we didn't, we didn't need to. We really had a nice focus purpose statement, a big visual pulling most of the weight, 
little pop of color down below. Otherwise, we're really using um, the, the original photographer on site did a great job. Here's another example. We're back to Arlington House near Washington, D.C. This is uh, we hired an illustrator to show work on the um, on the house as it's being uh, as it's being constructed. Um, this is an archa uh, sorry, architectural history story, and you can see the different phases of work. Um, one paragraph of text, the 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 title paying tribute. It um, you know good punchy title that is interpretive in nature. It's trying to answer some of that. So what? It's not like we could have just simply said Arlington House would have been the subject title. That's a boring title. That's not getting it to the meat of the story. Paying tribute, tribute to what? Why was this? Well, it's about George Washington. That's why this house was originally built. Here's another example, Aztec Ruins National Monument. Um, so there, uh, there was a, a route um, for trading that went from Santa Fe to Los Angeles and we're kind of along that route. Why did this, um, place get uh, settled and populated at this time frame because otherwise you had to go all the way down to Mexico City and then take a boat to go all the way back up to Los Angeles. They found a mountain pass and it was treacherous and that treacherousness was part of the part of the story, all the river crossings and how many people died in the river crossing. They were just they were trying to discover this route. Again, good visual hierarchy. One image that centers everything, maybe there's a caption with it, an inset, in this case a map, so that, you know, person who, who wants that three minutes can dive in and really get into some of these details if they want. Let's see, next example here. This one, uh, Castillo de San Marcos in Florida. Two languages. You notice that this is a wider panel than the other ones. Spanish tends to take up, um, when, I'm, when I'm estimating, um, I'll, I'll translate English first be, um, because I'm an English speaker. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll do 125% space. I need to leave enough, that much more room for Spanish language because it just takes up more room than English. Other languages are less. I've done some stuff in Cherokee. It's much smaller than, than English. Um, but that bilingual, we're, we're connecting with more visitors. Um, language is power. Um, I've, uh, I did a, um, a couple projects in, in Wisconsin. We had some Ho-Chunk um language and illustration there um, use those multiple languages if you can uh, just make sure that one you got a good translator who can think about things interpretively not just word for word like the google translate isn't going to get it you want you want them to know your interpretive intent your purpose statement and make sure that comes across in your in their translation um, but again one large image um, so, uh, map is a subset. In this case, there were multiple sites, um, places in the, as you walked around the site, the historic fort. And it, it got confusing as to what era you were in. Sometimes it was Spanish, sometimes British, sometimes US. And so we made this little medallion system that, you know, when you're in different places, the different eras would light up or would be highlighted so you could see which era you were part of. And that seemed to work out. It was pretty effective. Here's a um, natural history story. So um, this, where is this? Cumberland Island. This is off the um, East Coast, uh, Georgia, North Carolina, somewhere in there. Um, and so this, uh, the live oak tree, um, just gorgeous tree with all the Spanish moss, but talking about the different species that live in very specific places, those, those micro habitats, um, or focusing in on those, on those plants. Um, and then you can dive deeper with all the different pieces, but that main story of all these different ecosystems exist on this one big tree. There's another historical example. This is Fort Pulaski, um, which I think, I think it's South Carolina. Um, sorry, I've been on enough of them that I get kind of blur right now. Um, Sometimes we're just trying to answer what is that thing the visitor is on site and it points and says what is that thing, and so this is a perfect example of we're explaining that so we've. I, this is a picture that I took on the site visit just for myself for orientation purposes and it ended up in the final panel. Um, and then we found a historic image from a slightly different perspective and I did this colorization thing so that way all the wood popped right away you're like okay we're focusing in on the wood. What was it there for. 
it, it wasn't there originally, but they recreated some of it here. Um, and it's, it's part of that reinforcement from all the cannonballs that were coming in. Let's see. So there was a chunk of, here's some examples. Now let's go a step further. How do we push this more? Here's an example of an outdoor tactile. This is a piece of bronze. Um, so wayside exhibits are innately visual. What happens when your visitors have low or no vision? Now you got to come up with something different. Um, tactile um, experiences are wonderful. They're also from a universal design perspective. Um, anybody who's out on site can touch this piece of bronze and experience this site. So this is downtown Minneapolis, Nicollet Mall. It's a brutalist architecture gem. Some people love brutalism, some people hate brutalism. But we're talking about in the early 1970s, what did this plaza look like when it was first built? Orchestra Hall is this built, built building here. And you can look over this railing and see how it is today. So there have been some changes. You can compare back and forth. And then there's um, this legend and braille. Um, all these letters are raised, um, kind of like the bathroom signs. So somebody can, some people lost their vision later in life. And so they know letter forms. So being able to just feel the letter N is faster than learning braille for some folks. But I like to pair that when I can. Um, and you can see there's a little tiny graphic panel on the left here. And I just took that full text and put it in the legend. We got a braille translator to get that there. And then the caption that's over here is, is down here. So that way, if somebody is here who can't see this panel, they still get the full experience of, as everybody else. And then they can go walk in the plaza itself just a few feet away. I like bronze a lot. It, last forever outdoors um real long lifetime it costs a little bit more like sometimes people want to do some epoxy models and i've done epoxy outdoor the problem is epoxy will degrade in three to five years so by the time you've done two or three of the molds you've paid for the price of bronze so i i always like starting with bronze first it'll it'll last longer it it, it has this quality to it that um, is real um, intriguing to people when they're on site um, and it can just handle Wisconsin weather really well. Uh, even the heat, like those, these will be up in, um, you know, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and or I have some in the Badlands in South Dakota. And I mean, bronze can get warm. Your your hands will touch it and then kind of pull off. But it, it it's not like the hood of your car where you're going to get scorched. Um, so it uh, it can handle that. Here's a Wisconsin example. So I was just at a um, conference a couple of weeks ago. We were presenting on this uh, Garmin Nature Preserve in Jefferson County. Um, this is the mock-up of the panel. Um, we're talking about all the drumlins and how you can feel where the glaciers went and the directions, the directionality. And so this is uh, LIDAR of the county. And then we printed it, we 3D printed it. And I cut out, um, I got from the architectural signage, you know, that you can get for your indoor buildings. I got just in acrylic raised letters and braille. And then um, the, the foundry that I work with um, popped these in before going through the um, casting process. Uh, and then, so this is paired with um, graphics and text to its side. And I have a picture of it all on site. No, I don't. Um, Sorry, it was raining that day. I <laughs> didn't get that cleaned off. But um, it, it, this, and this one is a tabletop where it's flat. Um, and, and being able to feel the drumlins as you're standing on top of a drumlin is, uh, is a pretty cool, pretty cool moment. That's a good aha moment. Uh, I'm just going to keep moving here. Maybe I'm hopefully not going too fast for everybody. Um, here's an example in Minnesota State Parks. So we did this, it's the same panel repeated at 10 different parks across the site, that, or across the state, that's what they're looking for. And it's talking about pollinators um, and things you can do to, to help pollinators. We added in a couple of really interesting features. So this, this pop out um, piece of um, high pressure laminate, um, you know, we're breaking out of the rectangular grid in that moment. We also have this cutout up here talking about what we wanted to talk about many different kinds of pollinators that are out here. And so these silhouettes are cut out and you can feel the edges, um, whether you can see or not, 
you can get a sense of the different shapes of different critters that are pollinators. Um, and for the eagle eye person, there's these push buttons down here. So we put in audio description. There's another prime moment for trying to get accessibility out there. Audio description is you're, you're, you're describing the view shed of what people are there and you're reading the text that's on here. It, it's for the people who um, uh, can't see her have struggle, see, uh, struggle seeing, that audio description provides the accessibility for them to have the same moment. But we put two buttons in here. And so now at each of the 10 sites, the local educator can record a 30 second message and they switch it out seasonally if they want to talking about this uh, kind of a straight up audio tour. You know, what is the what is the cool moment that's happening seasonally? And then the audio description talks about everything here. This um, kind of butterfly cutout, that's the speaker grill. So this box underneath has the speaker coming out right at the visitor. And this one is solar powered. So we hid the solar panel on the back. Um, other times I've done them hardwired. You just run the wire right down the tube on the side. Hi. Hello. Um, let's flip back. There we go. Here's an example um, of let's break out of the box of the standard National Park Service signage system like their frames. I love them. They work all the time, but sometimes you want something a little more creative or, or different. So this is at a park um, just south of the Twin Cities um, called Spring Lake Park Reserve. Um, and so it's some bent um, uh, this this is weathering steel um, with high pressure laminate bolted through from the back. We have some cutout letters. Uh, we did something similar. This is stainless steel. We wanted a slightly different look, um, and we had a shape of a river. Here we're talking about um, different types of boats that went down this river. This is in Pennsylvania, and we put a bronze sculpture of the different kind of boats. So there are like six different panels in this series, all talking about different kinds of boats. Um, and when you look at these from the side they almost disappear, especially when you're back really far, um, because there's, it's a strong enough material that you don't need the legs. It's just that thin material, um, which is less of a mar on the landscape, which is pretty nice. Um, and I see somebody asking about um, building materials. Here's the perfect example to talk about this. So um, there's kind of, I don't know, three or four different materials for the printing that get used outside that have a long um, shelf life. So uh, I use a lot of high pressure laminate. Um, companies like iZone or Fossil uh, make those. Uh, they have 10 year warranty. Um, your reds are gonna fade first, but um, you know, they'll last pretty good. If it, if it fades too quick, um, they might've you know, changed an ink or something, just give them a call and there's a, there's a limited warranty that handles some of that. Um, I've also used uh, fiberglass. So Paneer Graphics, uh, Pennsylvania. They do, um, they've done fiberglass since the 80s. Um, they now have a new process. It's still fiberglass, but it has a gel coat. So it's a slightly different um, process, a little less um, chemicals involved. Um, and they're great to work with. They also make bases. Um, and uh, so this one is, um, these are both steel. It's just weathering steel versus uh, stainless steel. Uh, here, I like the stainless better because it's on um, concrete. So it's not going to weep. Um, and this, this look, um, the brighter look was better for this park. Um, here, I think the darker look was better, but I wish that this would have been just in the grass a little bit more. Um, um, if we go back an example here, this is that standard National Park Service style, the cantilever base. So there's this bent um, aluminum. Um, it, it can be powder coated or painted. I've done both. Um, painted, it's easier to do touch-ups. You just get a little bit of touch-up paint and you can clean it. Um, how many places actually go and do that, I think is a, a valid question. Most of them just kind of let it be out there for a long time. And if you're going to go that route, powder coated is probably better. It'll last longer with less maintenance. Problem with powder coated is there's no touch up. Like if you want to get it touched up, you bring it to a sandblaster, they take all of the powder coat off and they put all new powder coat on. Um, yeah, that's, that's tough. Um, the, oh, the other panel. panel panel type I've used is um, uh, uh, porcelain enamel. It's more expensive, but it has a 25 year lifetime and the color on it is just incredible. It's not the right choice for everybody. Sometimes it's, it's the easiest one to either have in or out. Either you really want porcelain because you want that the high crisp minage and long time last, or you don't want to spend that much money. You want something that'll last 10-ish years and then you replace it. 
that's where the the um the phenolic resin as it used to be called in best uh, high pressure laminate or the um, fiberglass does better on that regard um here it's a it's half inch thick um inside here see there's a full frame around the edge so technically what happens is this bottom piece of the frame pops off and then you can slide in your piece of um, high pressure laminate this one is an eighth inch thick if it's eighth inch it needs the full frame otherwise it kind of warps a little bit um, half inch is very rigid and i can hide if there are threaded inserts hidden behind this so it bolts all the way through half inch will hide those threaded inserts um, other times I'll do quarter inch, but then I just I have a visible bolt that's on the front and you just poke a hole right through and then attach it to something. So let's see, let go back. Oh yeah, this one is half inch, so it's bolted from the back. I've done these in the past where it's exposed hardware. Um, and then you just got you know, make sure that you don't put text there or anything. Um, the my workhorse is um, you know, painted or power um, painted or powder coated aluminum and high pressure laminate that we just we do those all the time and they last a long time and they're cost effective and there's good companies oh there's a there's a wisconsin company um barking dog exhibits um i think she's near eau claire ruth reisler runs that uh, organization ruth's great to work with um she does all the bases and then if you need her she can get the the panels printed for you too she just works with eyes um, but then it's great. You're not shipping across the country. You're just shipping across the state and you're keeping the money in the state. Um, that is my last slide, I guess. Um, are there, are there more questions? I think I went faster than I was expecting. Um, hopefully we can have a big Q and a session and see what, uh, what questions you want me to take. Mm -hmm. So people could either throw them in the chat or you could um, unmute one at a time to ask. We have one in the chat. Are there panel materials that are graffiti resistant or withstand cleaning better? So that's part of the reason that I chose the high pressure laminate and the, um, the uh, fiberglass. Um, they're graffiti resistant. There's, a, there's like a bumpy material on the top that it makes it easier to clean off of. Nothing is 100% graffiti proof, um, but it's easier to clean. I've also seen the fiberglass panels. Um, there's a park in Minnesota that does this and it's great. Every two years, they take out their panels, they bring it down to the local boat um, repair place who just buffs it up with you know boat wax and brings it back and they slide it in and it's it's gleaning. It's, just, it, that's, it's the same material that he's used to, to coat it. Um, with the with the aluminum, um, you know, if somebody were to tag it with the painted, you know, you can just paint over that a little bit. Um, powder coat is a little harder to tag, but it's still possible. So then if somebody tags it, you got to kind of hit it with the, with the cleaning material or re, um, re powder coat it. Um, the, from an eco perspective, um, I think iZone has an, um, on their website talks more about how they're using recycled materials in their process. Um, the, the chemicals that are used in the pressure, I think, is, is still slightly toxic, um, but it's not as bad as fiberglass, which is pretty toxic. Um, and then the other argument is that, so if you print one of these once every 10 years, it's, it's better for the environment than printing one you know, out of, say, dye bond, and every two years you got to replace it. Um, yeah, uh, list the companies that I mentioned. Okay. So iZone imaging, they're out of Texas, um, Pioneer graphics. They're out of, um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They do both panel, the fiberglass panels and the, um, the aluminum, um, uh, barking dog exhibits is the Wisconsin based, um, uh, aluminum manufacturer. Um, those are probably the three I talked about. Um, then there's the porcelain enamel, so Windsor Fireform, and uh, there's another guy out there. Anyway, um, I don't use those too often, but those are the ones that I use the most. Um, for um, for bronzes, the bronze tactiles, um, there's a company here in the Twin Cities called um, Blue Rhino Studio. Um, so they are clay sculptors, or if they got to get some 3D printed, they bring it in. So the, I work with them to to build the mold, and then they work with a, a casting house that's here in the Twin Cities that does does the molding process and uh so we've done that a ton um 
I mean, you can also bring me in and I can hire out Blue Run or whoever. It just depends on what you're depends on what you're looking for. If you need a designer, you don't need a designer. You know, what, whatever you need. Um, I can. I'm. I'm going to send out a follow up email tomorrow with some of these resources, and I can put a list of those companies in if that's helpful for people. Perfect. I think there's another one. Can you talk about adding QR codes or links for additional content? Yes. Is it worth it? I'm wondering so, that too. <laughs> so I got a soapbox on this one. So for years, I was anti QR code because it um, you need hosting. You need there's a whole bunch of eco or I'm sorry, um, digital side of infrastructure that you need. And how many people knew how to use QR codes? Like I got to download this custom app. I got to point it at the thing. I got to know how to click it. Like it was this whole process of getting people to even use it in the first place. I was very like, just don't do it. Nobody's going to do it. Nowadays, QR codes are starting to get built into the phone. Like you hold it up with your regular camera and it says, hey, do I want to click this? Okay. That's a lot easier. Um, the other th problem I had with QR codes is um, it's a blind click. Like if somebody puts a little sticker right on top of yours, all of a sudden you're going to a nefarious site that you didn't want to go to. But, you know, at least on the iPhone, it, it, it does a better job of like, do you want to click this? And it'll say, here's where you're going. And be like, I don't want to go there. Something's happening here. So, so QR codes are getting easier to use. I use them um, mostly when I need like real-time data. Like um, how do I navigate to something? I'll put in a QR code to a Google map. Um, what are the river levels? And it's the USGS has a website with exactly that information. Here's a QR code to open it up on your phone. Um, you know, you need that immediateness. That's when their QR code comes in handy. I also like to follow up a QR code and right underneath it, just have a, a short link, you know, your website slash QR7. And somebody just has to type in QR7 and then they're off, off to the site. Um, the the nice thing about the QR code is whatever that landing site is, you can change that in three years without having to reprint anything. You can put more information up, you can change your content, you can put a video up, all that is really easy to do from a QR code side. I rarely put like in a wayfinding panel, it's, you know, you can find more information at the park website and list out the whole website or you want to talk to leave no trace.org or something like that. I rarely put other websites on panels because websites disappear quicker than panels get reprinted. If you're going to put a, a URL in there, it needs to be one that you make sure is up for the duration of the panel, something that you control. Um, what's the next question here? Uh, can a busy sign that validates a three minute rule be justified as a site that is frequent almost exclusively by local residents? So your audience matters. Um, now, how many of your local residents know those particular stories? Um, the, I would argue that putting a really dense panel in front of anybody is going to be a turnoff. I'd rather break it up into multiple panels to make it approachable. It's the same reason in my emails I use bulleted lists when I can because people are like, oh, this is I can read this. This is an approach versus the wall of text. Like I'm gonna leave that till tomorrow. Like, you know. Um, but you're right, thinking about your audience, that will determine a lot of the the planning, especially in that proposal phase. Like, what's your purpose statement? Who's your audience? What are you what are your goals? Um, that's a big point. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, purpose I'm being created is awareness and a uh, um, preserve local history. So um, that seems more, at least in my head, is more of a is a branded moment. Like this is a this is on the National Register of Historic Places. This is a, you know won an award for a local um, architectural history type of thing. Um, that doesn't need to be a big sign. Like that that content is very concise. Now, if you want to give the history of the building. Now we're in a different point. Um, so trying to have scale it down to what are the, the what are the highlights you people you want people to get? Not because you can always you know re refer them to a book at the bookstore if somebody wants to deep dive. Um, well, that's the other trick with wayfinding maps. Um, somebody, if you put a wayfinding map on the panel, nobody can pick it up and bring it with them. So make it really clean. 
less information on there and then put a little um you know three panel brochure box on the side of like here's the map with the more information when you want to get there so you got the full information in there or the qr code to your um, to google maps or whatever but on the panel itself it's like very focused to specifically the thing that you want i just saw white text on a colored background is it reasonable on black and white that's a really good question so um my my thing is that um i need good contrast so um like on this picture that i have on screen right now um the chris evans is in black against a mostly gray light gray background there's real good readable text on that if i were to put it up in the top in the dark it would be really hard to read so you can get that contrast with a light background or with a dark background the legibility some of the most important factors are the contrast the size of the text the letting, the spaces in between each line, and the kerning, the spaces in between each letter horizontally. With all those combined, you can get something that's really legible on both backgrounds, light or dark. I think you can also get that with a sans serif versus a serif typeface. Sometimes you gotta make the text a little bit bigger. All of my panels um, have really big main body text um, because I want it to be legible. The the one trick I will throw out is that if you have a panel that is mostly white background, you're going to have two problems. One is the sun will bounce on it and hit blind someone when they're trying to read it, which is not helpful. And the other one is that everything you print on, there's going to be little inaccuracies in the material. So I want a certain amount of ink on top of it to hide those inaccuracies. So I still have white pop through like in the lettering, but I'm not going to have a big area of white. I need to cover it with, you know, 10 to 15% gray or something like that. Um, ah, a whiteboard outside, add observations. So getting, um, uh, oh, sorry, we're gonna have a cat visit. You all okay with, with kittens appearing? We just got two kittens and they are frisky. <laughs> um, so, uh, Anytime you can engage your visitor to contribute is awesome. What are the questions you're prompting them with? What are the materials you're letting them use? I like so you know, like a um, a clipboard that you use to you know take notes in the field. That clip, get a bunch of those clips, put it on a wall in a grid, and then give some paper and let people write stuff and pop it on the clips. It's really easy to take it off. You give them pencils. Are you creating litter? Um, so you got to be mindful of that. And then do you want any um, uh, filtering? Are you going to have somebody show up twice a day to pull out the bad words? Or are you going to let people kind of do their own thing? Um, I find if people, if you let them be anonymous, you're going to get more junk than if you let them sign their name. Generally, if people, you know, if their name is attached either digitally or, or written, they'll be a little bit better with the content that they're putting up there. Um, also bullets and cases, like um, <laughs> I've been to so many national parks that have terrible bullets and cases, you know, it'll just be full of garbage, full of ads that, you know, the, the event is not there anymore. And like the lawyers that said you need 72 things, put them all into the bullets in case, like tidy those things up. <laughs> it's uh, it, your, your park visitors will, will appreciate you. Uh, but you could use a bulletin case as an option of because what in, in, with the with the paper on the clip what happens when it rains maybe you can get it under an awning or, or that type of thing um what's the next question here person takes pictures of maps and trails um yeah i see people taking pictures of, of interpretive stuff all the time too it's they want to remember it on their trip or they want to share it with a friend um what kinds of glass should be or uh, signage should be covered with plexi or glass good question so um my personal opinion if you put plexi on top of something like a a, um, a looser material like paper without adhesive um you're probably going to get dew and and water in there and, it, and it's going to fog up and it's going to be hard to read 
So I tend to like to get the high pressure laminate because it, there's nothing covering it, but it's but it's um, easy to read and it's it's graffiti um, resistant. Um, the bulletin case is the way to go if you if you need some of that um, interchangeable stuff, easily changeable stuff. But the bulletin cases are you know three four inches deep, so there's room for the fog to kind of not be in between the paper and the glass. Um, the other trick, especially in Wisconsin, is that you got the freeze and thaw, and so anytime you got materials expanding and contracting at different rates, there's a chance for cracking. Um, so that's the nice thing about the high pressure laminate is they figured out everything in that panel is is pretty much going to swell in, at the same time, and then my my bolts that are holding it into the um, into the steel. So the steel and the high pressure laminate are going to move at different rates, um, but there's some there's some room in those holes to kind of move with that so it's so you're not gonna destroy something in just you know one winter season or something like that i have tried to have um like you want to frame an exact view on a landscape so you got this sheet of glass or plexi that you've printed or put um vinyl lettering on to kind of say look at this view shed exactly where you want to go now somehow you got to get everybody's head into a different spot see so there's a certain amount of fudge factor there um, but I have tried to do that outside, and um, in that case, I tend to like to use um, uh, tempered glass, so it, it won't break as easily. Um, if it does break, it's not going to hurt somebody's fingers, um, but the plex is just too easy to scratch with a key. Um, so Harper's Ferry Center, whenever they test materials, um, it's a big pen test. Like you could take a key and scratch surfaces, but they just take a, a big pen, you know, close so it's not open and just run it across the surface. Is that enough to, to kind of break into the surface or not? Um, good materials will withstand more of that. I mean, anybody who's really trying can destroy anything. Um, you know, people have pocket knives, all sorts of stuff. Um, I also try to use security bolts where I can, like it might be a, um, a star key or a hex key or something that that you know a standard screwdriver won't get into it some people have you know the same tools on their bikes so they might be able to take it off if they're really trying but um it's the same rule that i have in my house like you know i have locks on my door to make it harder to get in somebody can still smash the window and get in like let's just make it so the easy things aren't going to happen um Talk a little bit more about font choice and font sizes. Yeah, so um, I need to look up this exact value. Um, so ADA has a minimum um, X height. So I'm going to stop sharing. So we're not looking at that screen anymore. Um, so your letters, like a capital letter, I'm sorry, lowercase little letter X from the bottom of the X to the top of the X is your X height in different fonts or different typefaces have different sizes of that X height. So you want something with a high enough X height um, because there's a minimum X height. I want to say it's 3 16 of an inch, might be 3 eighths. I always got to look it up. Um, the, the Smithsonian guide, I'll pull that one too. Um, Smithsonian uh, guide to accessibility. I, that, that's a manual I refer to all the time, indoors and outdoors. I'll just pull it and throw it in the chat right now. Um, uh, that'll say exactly what that number is. So, you see, so check that your main body font is that X height at the smallest, and it's going to be bigger than you think it is. That, um, I'm often at like 36 to 48 point for my main body text. It's pretty big. Um, captions can maybe be a little bit smaller, and then um, whenever I do a credit line, personally, like photographers deserve credit, fully on board. I don't want like this giant phrase of like, it came from this gallery donated by this person, you know, just like, you know, Wisconsin Historical Society on the side, small. It's, it's there when you need it, but it doesn't grab your attention most of the time. That's how I do credit lines. Um, from a font perspective, I tend, like the general adage in design school is choose two typefaces make them different enough um, so that we, they, they feel different, but um, they should they should interplay with each other. So it, often the call is like have a serif and a sans serif for either your main body or your, your body. Um, do no more than two. 
if you're going to break that rule, you need a good reason not to break that rule. So sometimes like maybe your, your pull quotes use a third typeface or something like that. You're like, it's just very minimal when you're doing that. Um, and my, my main body type, I tend to like, um, fatter, um, not necessarily bold, but like the strokes are a little bit um, fatter. That that allows me to have slightly smaller type, but still readable, and, and, and it demands attention. Um, the now the actual choice of the typeface they're using, I think um, your site and your audience is going to help determine that. Like, do you want a contemporary modern look? Do you want a um, historical look. So I did a, a, a project for Thomas Jefferson's Poplar Forest, which is the um, the building that he built after the um, Monticello. He wouldn't say this, but it's his retirement home. Um, there, our main body typeface is Century New Gothic, which is the same typeface that was used in C. Jane Run. Like we wanted that academic vibe happening. And so that's our main body. And then for or the, sorry, that's our title. And then the main body, we chose a real contemporary, um, modern, clean to kind of make it feel new. So I had this old and new thing going on. Um, the other like, okay, now I'm getting super into type. Not everybody is a geek, type geek like I am. But look at the letter A and the letter G when you're comparing two typefaces. So the capital is so a lowercase letter A and lowercase letter G. Does the A have, a, you know, it's basically an O with a stem on the end, or does it have, the, you know, the swoop in the middle? Um, I'm using terrible typography phrases. My, my art teachers are going to hate me. But, you know, those are two different shapes of the A, right? Same thing with the G. Does the, does the G swoop down, or does it have a little, like, you know, circular part to it in the bottom? Your main body type and your um, headline type, do they have the same shape A and the same shape G? that is a good indication you're headed down a good path. It's not always, you know, you need to match one to one, but those are some of the first things I look for is like, yeah, these, these letter forms feel similar, even though one serif and one sans serif. Um, compressed fonts, you can fit more lines, more words in a line of text, but it's harder to read. So careful with compressed, especially from an accessibility point of view. So I have a question and I don't see any more in the chat, so I'm gonna jump in. So we've been thinking a lot about translation of our park signage and you had one example with English and Spanish, but what happens when you wanna go beyond that? Because you don't want a sign that's got 80 languages on it. So how have you dealt with that in the past? Digital um, or handouts. So you might have at the front um, gate, there are, um, 30 different brochures and people can choose their one um, language or um, uh, or they like, get an iPhone app and so you can say I'm at stop seven I'm in German read me the German um, there's ways to, to do it that way um, getting a lot of languages and a lot of translation certainly takes time and effort um, but it's a great way to be more accessible um, language is power like can you get the Ho-Chunk language, can you, it, sorry, if anything is a written language, I don't know all the stories on all of them. Like I tried to do something with um, uh, down in El Paso and the, the local tribe there, it, it's oral history only, there's no written. So so we put in audio players that are in English, Spanish and Antigua because it's an oral tradition. Um, but, you know, small Hmong, whoever your local population is, um, yeah, hit those languages. Um, but you're right, it, you know, you could have a panel 10 miles long and have 30 languages on it and it's going to turn some people off like there's a, there's a mar on the landscape there. It's a it's a hard balance to, to navigate. The most I've done is three languages on one panel. Um, and you got to be really concise what you want to say, because each of those languages takes up square inches. I'm going to ask a follow up. So when you say um, like digital, like an app, is that is that are you thinking like a qr code or like a specific app that you design that would have like a site number and you go to that site and then you could listen or read something uh so there's a couple of different ways of solving it so if you have if you control your own website and you have a web developer you could easily make like a section of your site that is here's the same thing in four different languages and okay. then um 
you just you move people to that website and then they just use their browser on their phone. That's step one. Um, you could also have a custom app built um, that'll handle all that for you. And then I, there's probably some off the shelf apps. I've used um, Tourmate in the past and um, OnSell. That's another company. Um, personally, I don't do apps. I hire out that part. I'll do a lot of the tech, but the app part, there's, there's a lot of app manufacturer out there. So I, I, I rely on them to do that part. Um, how, how does somebody know that they're in the right place? That's a question to solve. How does the app know where you are? Is it, uh, I'm at stop number four. I type in number four and I can listen to it. Cool. Straightforward. Maybe it's a phone number that people call. I used to be like, you know, the phone numbers are the old way of doing it. People, you know, it's, it's a turnoff. It's from the, you know, the early 1980s or whatever. And it's, everybody knows how to dial a phone. So it's actually more accessible than I thought it was. Um, uh, but is it GPS triggered? Do you do you have a? Um, I've, I've seen some people with like AR VR apps, so like you move into different spaces and it, it, it triggers content automatically. Um, those are cool, especially in an outdoor setting when it can get satellites. Like that's great. Indoors doesn't work very well. Um, NFC tags are interesting, so I built those into my um, business card. That if you hold my business card up to your phone, it'll automatically add to your um, address book. Um, and I just bought a little NFC sticker for each tag and like put it on the inside of the of the card. But NFC stickers are pretty cheap to buy. Um, and you could, I haven't tried this yet. Here's an R&D question. But, you know, can you put that sticker in the back of your eighth inch high pressure laminate with a, you know, a, a, a diagram of put your phone here? Can it trigger the NFC? Um, would that NFC sticker work in in the winter, like all those things I got to test, but um, that's kind of the new QR code, if you will. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? If you don't want to chat it out, you can unmute and ask. It seems like there are any, Chris, any final remarks from you before we wrap it up? Um, one, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm, I can always talk about design and I'm glad you all are thinking about it. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about stuff. The, um, my biggest point of advice, I think, is just, just start, figure out a project that you got and, and start thinking about how do, how, do you, how do you get those interpretive stories across? And how do you get some of those accessibility features across? Just pick one and do it. It looks like we have one final question. Someone's wondering about costs. Yeah. So um, from a um, from a grant writing purpose, one of the, the numbers I've used, like a straight up National Park Service sign, um, you need the planning, the writing, the fabrication, the installation, um, the the fabrication yeah it um and you have a bunch of them so you got 20 20 panels you want to put out there you can budget between say five to seven thousand dollars for each one of them um depends on how much illustration work you want depends on how much custom map making you want depends on how much translation you want like it can add up from there um and so depending on the project you can come in under that but if you're writing a grant, like that's a starting place. Um, I always like to build, get the custom cost of like, okay, we know that we're building seven of these and four of these, and it'll cost this much. Like I, I like to dial that in when I when I can before the before the contract start. Like get it tighter for you. Um, but yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for this presentation. This was fantastic. Um, and I'll send out a reminder to everyone that was, or not a reminder, a follow-up email tomorrow to everyone that was registered with some of the resources that Chris mentioned. And if there's something that's missing, we can you know, reach back out to him and make sure we can get that information out to all of you. And we'll also be uploading this recording to our website so you can share it with others in your group if they weren't able to attend. So Thanks thank you, everybody. Thanks, Chris. Bye, all. Bye. Bye.